Hey everyone, Pete here. Hope you're doing well. And uh, we're going to be doing another live conversation I'm really excited about uh, with the senator from uh, the state immediately north of where I'm sitting, uh, Senator Gary Peters. I'm going to try to pull him in now. As you know, this is always the most awkward moment of an Instagram live with a guest because it takes a second for your humble host to figure out what button to push. Here we go. Let's see. Senator Peters, do we have you on your way in? Meanwhile, hope everybody's doing all right. We are officially in voting season. I'm not even calling it election day anymore. Voting season because it's underway. There we are. Senator, how are you? I'm well, Pete. How are you? Well, you, uh, you did that very well. You navigated that technology really well. I'm impressed. <laughs> I tell you, practice makes perfect, right? I'll never quite be the more tech uh, fluent person in the household, but I'm catching on. <laughs> Well, um, uh, just for folks uh, who, who are our followers who uh, don't know the senator, let me, let me provide a, a quick introduction and explain why I'm very personally invested in the race. Uh, first of all, I can't, I can't claim to see Russia from my house, but I can almost see Michigan from my house because uh, Nile, right. Michigan is a short bike ride that way. On the other end of the state is uh, uh, the hometown of my, my very favorite Michigander, uh, Chaston, uh, Traverse City, and we're up there as often as we can be. And so uh, this is a very important state to me. This is also such an important state to America. And uh, Senator Peters is uh, in a, a, an intense reelection battle that we know is going to uh, result in returning into the Senate. And I'm really excited to take a little bit of time together to, uh, to talk about why. But uh, first of all, uh, Senator, what's... Uh, uh, almost has it, saying how are you feels like a loaded question these days. But uh, uh, <laughs> let me put it this way: How's your uh, how's your optimism level today? Well, it's uh, you know I always stay optimistic. You always got to be uh, looking for a brighter future, uh, uh, even during very challenging times, as you know. And it uh, clearly is tough. And you know, I'm the uh, ranking member on Homeland Security Committee in the Senate, so I oversee FEMA as part of my uh, many responsibilities of oversight. And FEMA's charged with the oversight with the COVID pandemic. And right now, you know, people say, what's the number one issue? There's no question. Uh, going across Michigan, I'm sure all across the country. How do we get through this crisis? How do we deal with the public health aspects of it? How do we uh, make sure our economy can rebound as quickly as possible? And uh, that takes a, a lot of time. And, and then we've uh, got Mitch McConnell that all of a sudden uh, thinks instead of dealing with that, why don't we jam a Supreme Court nominee through instead, uh, which is pretty outrageous. Uh, but other than that, everything's good. <laughs> it must be so frustrating to, to have seen the, the Senate majority refuse to act on COVID relief, refuse to act on uh, reforming our democracy. And then, and then suddenly they're, they're just ready to go at, at warp speed when, when it comes time to uh, get their ideological way on, on the court. Um, before I go any further, by the way, congratulations. I saw that the Detroit Free Press endorsed you over the weekend and uh, must be great to have a, another vote of confidence in your campaign and, and your Senate service. Well, that's right. I'm, I'm honored to, to get uh, their endorsement. It was, uh, and I was really uh, humbled by the fact that it was uh, really a strong endorsement. I mean, they, uh, it was a, a great write-up and certainly all your viewers, uh, go, go to Detroit Free Press, check out the endorsement that came out Sunday. That'd be great. Yeah, it's worth checking out because it just kind of, I think it sums up the race so well. And, and uh, you know, part of the work that, that you were talking about, uh, I think is, uh, especially in terms of your leadership on, on the emergency management front, uh, you know, a lot of times that's not in the spotlight until it suddenly is, right? Can, can you share a little bit? I mean, knowing that, that you've been among the leaders on Homeland Security, FEMA, as you mentioned, uh, getting ready to think about crises. Uh, what's it been like to suddenly watch the country plunged into multiple crises? I mean, we've, we've got a, a, a democratic crisis, I think, on our hands. Certainly, uh, of course, the public health crisis. There's a moral crisis in terms of uh, racial justice, and, and you represent uh, one of the most racially diverse states in the country, uh, a, a, uh, an economic crisis with so many uh, jobs that have been lost. Um, how, how well do you feel America was prepared for this? And, and what are the main things you think of when you go into those, those committee rooms in the Senate, trying to make sure we're ready for whatever might be coming around the corner next? Well, it is, it is a uh, constant challenge. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I'll mention the, the Homeland Security issues, but I'm, I'm also the ranking member of a subcommittee on the Armed Services Committee, which I, I serve on. And I'm the ranking member of the committee, which is Emerging Threats and, and Capabilities, which is all about future warfare, where those threats are going to be, and trying to stay on top of that, particularly with technology changing rapidly. It's a, a really quite a, uh, quite a uh, challenging uh, endeavor. But to go back to Homeland Security and the pandemic, actually, last year, I, 
I had my committee staff do a report on drug shortages, which I saw as a national security threat. Here, here in the United States, we have shortages of drugs on a regular basis that hospitals have to deal with because we're overly dependent on foreign sources, particularly the precursors, those, those chemicals that go into nearly every drug that we use. Most all of it's from overseas, over 80% overseas, most of it uh, from China. And we're dependent on them. And so when that report came out last year, I concluded, I said, uh, when, there, when there is a pandemic in this country, uh, the United States is gonna be in a very precarious uh, situation because it's not just drugs, it's med supplies like surgical masks. Uh, little did I know just a few months later, here we are. Uh, and we uh, needed a much quicker response from this administration. I was front and center on that. And we were asking questions, are we the oversight? It's the administration that has to do the work. We provide the oversight. We're pounding on the table, and particularly when it came to testing, why were we not testing? When, when some of those cases were, were, we didn't have that initially, when we didn't have many cases, yep. that's when you really have to wrap yourself around it, do the contact tracing, have the testing so that you can control it. Uh, and, and had you acted early, uh, we could have stayed in that situation, but this administration didn't, especially when it testing. I remember a meeting that we had, and we were pounding uh, the, on the table to the administration and saying, uh, why are we not testing like other countries? South Korea, that was massive right. testing. As you know, the South Koreans were able to get ahead of this a whole lot quicker than we were. Uh, this administration really dropped the ball and we're paying the price for it. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's so upsetting to uh, w when you have that patriotic sense that you want our country to be the best in everything. We want to be leading in everything, but, right. but not leading in, in the death toll, which is obviously what's happening right now. Um, Absolutely. Well, one thing I want to mention is the uh, U.S. Navy Reserve. So uh, uh, it's certainly an experience that shaped my life, and uh, uh, you had a, uh, a distinguished career in the military. Can you share a little bit about uh, how your military service experience shapes the, the way you come at leadership now, and, and uh, maybe uh, also just uh, uh, kind of how it shapes your, your worldview? Well, absolutely, and uh, thank you for your service. And I'm glad we uh, we share uh, service in the U.S. Navy Reserve, which was an incredible experience uh, for me. And uh, I'm sure my experience is just like yours. Uh, we were blessed to be able to serve with some of the most patriotic individuals uh, that you'll ever meet, who believe deeply in this country and are and are willing to to serve. And uh, many in the reserve have full time jobs and have uh, uh, families, uh, and yet are willing to drop that at the drop of the. Uh, or uh, instantly uh, to serve the country if uh, the call is there and, and get out. So it, it has had that uh, relationship uh, for me in serving. Uh, I served uh, and uh, had the opportunity to have a number of different uh, assignments and also learn more about exactly how the military deals with uh, the issues. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to complete a course of study at the U.S. Naval War College and the Command and Staff uh, School. You know, and that kind of that kind of experience, both being serving and as a former lieutenant commander in the Navy Reserve and having other uh, training uh, uh, really informs a lot of what I do in the Armed Services Committee, clearly, uh, and the work as uh, the ranking member on the on the uh, Emerging Threats and Capabilities Committee, which in addition to the emerging threats, we oversee all the special operations forces. Uh, the Navy SEALs, for example, are are part of that as well. And as you are fully aware and you've talked about at length, we live in a very dangerous world. Uh, we need to have a cert. Uh, U.S. leadership and understand that that uh, national security is more complex than just the strong military, as important as that is. And we have the best military in the world, uh, bar none. Uh, but you have to have a strong military. You have to have a strong economy. But you also have to have friends. You have to have allies. When you go into war, we want to go in with friends. And that's what, uh, to me, is so striking about the, the lack of leadership from President Trump is that he doesn't seem to understand that. He cozies up to folks who are our adversaries and then doesn't work with our allies and friends. Uh, that has to change. Yeah, one of the most alarming things I think to watch has been the, just the collapse in international respect. You know, they'll ask people around the world, uh, do you trust the U.S. to do the right thing? And uh, I was just reading, uh, 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 there's an amazing story about uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and President Kennedy sent Dean Acheson on a, on a secret mission that the retired Secretary of State called him out of retirement to go to the President of France, just because we knew we might need some help there on the international stage. And he brought uh, highly classified uh, documents, photos, evidence of the Soviet activity in Cuba. And uh, the French President Charles de Gaulle received him, uh, uh, according to this account, uh, and was a little grumpy uh, in a very French kind of way, said, you know, you've come not to consult me, but to inform me. But then the moment he offered to 
uh, uh, show the, that photographic evidence, the French president just waved him away and said, your president's word is enough. And uh, I just think about, you know, any scenario where you could plausibly imagine this president's word being enough for anybody. Uh, and, and it really does matter to have that, that layer of trust behind, uh, behind all of those relationships. Um, I know this, this also, your, your service and, and your work has made you really passionate for veterans. Can you share a little bit about what, what you've been doing on the ground for veterans across the state of Michigan? Well, absolutely, uh, I do. In fact, uh, 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 legislative work that I did in Bill I passed uh, is quite meaningful. Uh, it dealt with uh, veterans who are suffering from the invisible wounds of war, PT, uh, PTSD. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I uh, uh, really leaned in on an issue as a result of a constituent uh, here in Michigan that came to my attention uh, who uh, is a Marine. Uh, he served with uh, distinction uh, in Afghanistan. You know very well about what that all involves. But when he came back from uh, Afghanistan, uh, things weren't so great for him. Uh, he was dealing with PTSD, which, but it was not diagnosed by anybody here in the States. And some of those behaviors, as well as the self-medication associated with that, ended up getting him basically uh, removed from the Marines. He was kicked out of the Marines, had a bad paper discharge, and he ended up homeless, homeless on the streets of Grand Rapids and really suffering and not knowing what was going on with his, his life. He went to the VA. The VA examined him, they diagnosed him, they said, you are suffering from PTSD. We, but unfortunately, we can't help you because you had a bad paper discharge yeah. from the Marines, so you are not entitled to, to the benefits. And yet he received those injuries as a result of his honorable service in Afghanistan. So I went to work, I was able to build a coalition of veterans groups across the, the country in support, and we passed legislation had, and put into law that now allows him and others in that same situation, go back. If you've got credible medical evidence that you're suffering from PTSD, you can have a board review whether or not that discharge was justified and hopefully get it changed so you can get into the VA and get the help that you've uh, or certainly earned and certainly deserve. And uh, it's, uh, now we realize we're talking about tens of thousands of folks. This, is a, yeah. this was a huge problem. Uh, we certainly have to lean in to make sure the, the military is actually diagnosing folks before they leave the military. Right. But there needs to be some due process to, to come back. So that's something I'm very passionate about. I've also been passionate about making sure when veterans come back from active duty and transition into civilian life that they can get uh, good jobs and careers and, and use their GI Bill as broadly as possible. We often think of the GI Bill with four-year college or two-year uh, but as you know, you can also use it for apprenticeship programs and skill right. training, something we desperately need in this country. And veterans love that work. Uh, and now uh, I just recently passed a bill that's signed into law by the president uh, that will expand uh, apprenticeship opportunities for veterans uh, to use their GI Bill. So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I try to work at this from a variety of angles because uh, we, we owe uh, those who uh, have had our back uh, as a country, we need to have their back. That's uh, uh, such a great example of the, the, the way you can use your office to make a difference for people. So thank you. You know, as somebody who, who served with people who were in that exact situation where, uh, you know, they, they had uh, issue, mental health issues or behavioral issues that were clearly a consequence of their service, uh, only to have that wind up uh, leading to a discharge that made it harder for them to get treated. I know uh, acting to, to fix that and, and, and clear that up is going to make so many veterans better off. So I, I, I really, I really appreciate that. It makes me think of one of the questions that, that came in too, because, you know, the things you're talking about, uh, you know, you and I share a lot of the same political values that we share the same political party, but the things you're describing aren't, uh, at least they shouldn't be uh, partisan. So uh, one of the questions was uh, when, when, when Joe Biden is hopefully president, how do we get back to solving big problems in a bipartisan way? And I know you've worked across the aisle to get stuff done. What do you think it's going to take, especially with uh, uh, the, the direction that's, that, that uh, things have taken in the Senate lately? I, I just think that's such a, a huge question and such an important question uh, for, for our, our country. And as you mentioned, uh, I'm a proud Democrat and share democratic values. We both uh, have those values. Uh, but we also know we have to come together and find common ground. And although there are differences between the parties and, and the selections about those differences, when it comes to government, what actually works and come together and get the done. And I'm very concerned about this hyper-partisanship that we see that makes that very difficult. And when you think back, uh, you've talked a little bit about some history. My history, re reading George Washington's farewell address uh, before the Senate. Every year a senator is asked to do that. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to do that. And, and he talked about uh, 
he called it factions, not uh, partisanship, but that these yeah. factions, if you don't come together, could lead to the demise of this new republic. And he thought that if we can't find a work, way to work together, that you'll see the rise of demagogue that will appeal to people's yeah. fear and dark side, and that will be the end of the republic. This is serious stuff. Uh, we have to come together to do it. Uh, I uh, work on a bipartisan basis uh, every opportunity I get. In fact, uh, I've been ranked as one of the most bipartisan members of the, of the Senate. Uh, the, there's actually folks that study that. Uh, it's the Luger Center out of Georgetown University. They rank every member of the House and the Senate. Their most, ranking, their most recent ranking, I'm the third most bipartisan Democratic senator serving. Uh, other groups have also recognized that. In fact, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which, Pete, as you know, is not a Democratic organization by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> Far from but, it. Uh, but they just uh, recently uh, uh, awarded me their inaugural Jefferson Hamilton Award for bipartisanship because I'm willing to, to reach across the aisle. And what's significant about that uh, uh, for the long term is that that's how you get stuff done. I've also been ranked as one of the most effective members. And I'm just a freshman. I'm in my first term. Uh, but there's a center called the Center for Effective Lawmaking. It's a group out of the University of Virginia and Vanderbilt University. And they rank every member of Congress based on the, the bills you put forward, what gets done, how significant this uh, matrix that measures folks. And in the last Congress, uh, there'll be another one after these two years, but in the last Congress of the 48 Democratic senators, I was ranked the fourth most effective in getting things done. And I'm a freshman, so I felt very good about that. I hope to continue that. And just to put it in perspective, this is because I'm in the minority in the Senate. Right. Over the last two years in the United States Senate, I have written and passed more bills through the United States Senate than any other member of the U.S. Senate, either Democratic or Republican. And the Republicans are in the majority. I've passed more bills through the U.S. Senate than any, any Republican senator. And I think that's the kind of model to your question we have to come forward, be true to our values and our core values that I, I, I uh, believe in and believe that's uh, where the country needs to go. But when it comes to actually governing, we've got to find uh, common ground. Never, never uh, compromise your values, but find yeah. common ground to get things done to help the American people, like, like the bill that I mentioned for, for veterans. Uh, you know, that's about building the consensus to help veterans and certainly right. many other examples of things I've worked on. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, uh, that that's been recognized. And, and you're right, that's not a small thing for the Chamber of Commerce to recognize a, a Democrat. That's, that's a good sign that, uh, you know, that, that work across the aisle has made a big difference. By the way, if you're watching, you're not familiar with uh, uh, Senator Peters' uh, uh, race or you want to get more involved, petersformichigan.com, a uh, great place to, to chip in a few bucks, uh, sign up to volunteer, uh, or, or simply to, to, to learn more about the race. Some of what you were just saying reminded me of uh, 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 kind of my experience as, as mayor and, and another question that came in that I think is, is great. Um, uh, you both have served in, in state and local office. Uh, how does that experience impact your views on the role of the federal government? I can definitely say, you know, being on the ground uh, as mayor, you learn you just don't have, you know, there's a great saying. I think it was a, uh, uh, a former mayor of LaGuardia in New York. So there's, there's no Democratic way to fill in a pothole or Republican way to pick up the trash. You just got to get it done. And even though I'm, I'm a strong Democrat and I believe in the values of my party for a reason, you did just figure out how to get stuff done. And often you could you could reach across the aisle that way. How, would you say that your, your prior experience has really shaped your approach to, to the federal picture? Uh, there's no, no question. And when you bring up uh, municipal gov government, uh, I was not a mayor as uh, you were. I was a member of a city council. Uh, and uh, there's uh, that's where I started as a city council person. And. Uh, there's no question that is where the rubber meets the, the road. Uh, folks uh, uh, come to your meetings uh, and uh, go to the microphone right in front of you and uh, have, are not bashful in sharing their views on how a city needs to be run uh, in a very uh, direct way. Uh, and, uh, and when, when you're in the grocery store, uh, folks also share it a very direct. They still do that with me now in the Senate, but uh, in a city, when you're running in a city, it's really personal. It's, it's yeah. things that touch their, their lives and their homes. Uh, very directly. And I never forget that. And when I'm working in, at the federal level, when we're thinking about resources and how right now it is so incredibly important that we help our local municipalities get through this COVID crisis that are seeing significant shortfalls in revenue because tax revenues have dropped because of the right. economic uh, aspects of it. Uh, but mayors like yourself and city councils still need to provide services and right. you need to make sure that uh, law enforcement and and uh, first responders are there and the fire department and all the services that happen every day. You know, I've been, I've dealt with those challenges and I think about that every day as a, as a member of the U.S. Senate now and 
when I served in the state Senate, it was the same thing that states are hurting. And that's why I certainly uh, work closely with uh, Governor Whitmer, who's doing an amazing job here in Michigan and making sure that uh, I can back her up in, in her efforts uh, to get this state up and running as quickly as and as fast as all of us uh, would like. But uh, as you know, we have to come together. State, uh, uh, local, federal officials need to come together. You can't solve these really tough problems that we face as a country if you're not doing it uh, together. Uh, and having that experience uh, uh, is, makes the world a difference. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that issue of, of supporting local government is, is huge. I, whenever I'm talking to fellow mayors, former mayor, as a former mayor, I'm in touch with uh, people in, in states that all have very different setups in terms of how the cities are financed, but what they all have in common is they're hurting. And, uh, you know, I, I would have thought that, that uh, uh, supporting cities uh, right now would be a bipartisan priority in the Senate. Uh, but it feels like it's it's being presented as a as a concession to the Democrats, uh, and and one of the reasons that the aid was in uh, the bills that did get passed had a lot to do with with you and others standing up for that kind of support. So I'm I'm, I'm really glad you're you're doing it. I know uh, we're we're uh, uh, we're coming up on uh, time, so I want to be sure to ask you uh, a little more tactically. So uh, for folks on the call, want to make sure that we send you back to the U.S. Senate want to make sure that we take back the White House. Uh, uh, talk a little bit about the mechanics of voting, early voting, uh, making sure you're registered, uh, whether the option to, to vote by mail is, is there. What, what do people uh, need to do right now in order to make sure we succeed? Well, thanks for asking that. And, and it is, as you know, Michigan is a key battleground state uh, that I think it's um, impossible to be president of the United States if you don't win Michigan. May not be sufficient condition, but necessary, just the way the Electoral College uh, writes. So uh, folks are focusing on it. And then my U.S. Senate race. I'm one of two Democrats uh, in a state that Donald Trump won. So the Republicans are coming at me with everything uh, they have. Uh, we have a very real shot to take uh, the majority in the United States Senate. It's very real. Uh, and now when we're in the Supreme Court uh, fight, uh, it's clear how important the United States Senate is. And having a Democratic majority is absolutely uh, critical. Uh, and, uh, and if we lose uh, the seat, if, I, if they come, if they're able to defeat me, uh, our very real but narrow shot to take the Senate gets a whole lot more difficult. And that's why I need help. Uh, they're pouring tons of resources. We've got uh, out-of-state billionaires uh, flooding the airways with false and negative ads. Billionaire as well, uh, Betsy DeVos's family, uh, the DeVos family, uh, has started a super PAC just to come after me and are spending millions of dollars also on false uh, negative uh, ads because they know how important it is. So right now, uh, the polls are close. Uh, we're basically uh, right at the margin of error, uh, and that's why they're pouring money in. It's absolutely critical that we have the resources to keep uh, fighting the battle. And to your point, it's about turning out uh, voters, Pete, as you know, and that's a, an absentee ballot program right now. Michigan voters are voting right now. In fact, I was just at an event uh, earlier. Uh, clerks started mailing out ballots on Thursday of last week, and I spoke to one of the clerks. They've already had, they had a rush out to the drop box because people have already filled up the drop box uh, with votes. So there is a lot of enthusiasm. But as Democrats, we need additional resources and volunteers to reach out to everybody all across the state Make sure Democrats turn out. We know we win Michigan when Democrats uh, turn out, uh, but we know we're going to have to have both uh, the financial resources and the volunteer help to, to make that happen and uh, truly uh, uh, turn Michigan into a blue state this year so that we can make sure that uh, we return our country to the values that I believe uh, this country has stood for from the beginning. So, so much depends on that. I know uh, recently we spoke with Governor Whitmer and she mentioned uh, 10 2020 is a goal to have your, uh, uh, your early vote in. So that's, uh, that's not that far off. Uh, and, and the sooner the better uh, uh, to make sure that we've just uh, uh, banked as many of those. Uh, uh, you know, the, the more folks have voted, uh, the less uh, uh, we need volunteers to call and check on you and chase you. Uh, and the more that frees up resources uh, uh, to make sure we get every uh, last eligible voter uh, that chance to vote and make sure they do. Um, just on a lighter note, I, I saw that you were on a motorcycle tour, which is uh, not part of uh, how I'm used to campaigning, although it sounds like a very efficient <laughs> way to, to cover a lot of ground. Can you just talk about that? Uh, where'd that idea come from and, and what's it been like? Well, it's, uh, it's a passion of mine. So the idea was that I love motorcycling. It's something I've done since I was a very, uh, very young child. Uh, that actually when I had my first paper route, I had to raise money. Uh, it was the only way my mom would let me uh, have a mini bike was I had to raise my money myself because she thought it was too dangerous. 
So I uh, had a paper bike, but I've been riding since then. And I do a trip as I do every year around the state of Michigan. Uh, uh, as part of my official Senate business, this year was a campaign, but uh, special, I do events all across it, as you know, from being to Michigan and Traverse City, it's a big state, particularly yes. up in the UP. And uh, this year, uh, again, I did the ride over 1200 miles. And I figure if I'm doing meetings all across the state of Michigan, the best way to get from point A to point B is on a motorcycle. So I ride my Harley Davidson. I have guest riders ride with me. I have veterans. Uh, I have Harley owner groups. I have labor. I have business folks. Uh, it's just a cross section of Michigan. Uh, and it's an opportunity to see this incredibly beautiful state uh, and, and feel it in ways you can't feel it except on a motorcycle, but also meet with folks and hear from folks. And I've always uh, said you got to do more listening uh, than talking when you're in public office. And it allows me to really get out there and hear from people. That's great. It is, uh, you know, I'm discovering it in new ways, uh, uh, thanks to, to Chaston. And um, uh, it is just such an amazingly beautiful state. I mean, from some of the world's great cities uh, to, to beaches that look, positively Caribbean to me when you see those those waters uh and uh, uh this time of year it's it's going to be great up north to, to see the leaves changing I hope you're able to uh, take that in and enjoy it a little bit I know how hard you're working both uh, in Washington and the Senate uh making sure that uh, uh that we continue to, to hold the line on our values and on the ground in Michigan uh doing doing such important work so uh, uh team Pete is uh, behind you uh I know that uh, uh there's so many people around the country as well as in the home state of Michigan eager uh, uh, to make sure that, that you're successful. Uh, Petersformichigan.com, right? Uh, uh, the website to uh, get more information, chip in a little bit of, if you can. He's not kidding about that outside money, some of that dark money coming in because it is so neck and neck. And so the, the Republicans are going to do everything they can to, to, to grab this seat. Uh, but the road to that Senate majority that, that I think at the beginning of this year, nobody would have imagined we could have retaken the Senate. Now it's clearly within our grasp, uh, but the road to getting that done runs right through Michigan. So Senator, I know you got a lot on your plate uh, and a busy day as always, but really glad we were able to connect. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, placing a, a congratulatory phone call uh, in a few weeks. So uh, we'll do everything we can between now and then to uh, help get you there. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for your leadership uh, over the years as well. Your service in the military, but your uh, service uh, in, in, in the government uh, as well, and your continued engagement. Uh, you inspired so many people uh, across our country uh, with your message, and the fact that you're continuing uh, to do that, uh, it means a great deal, and it's going to make a difference in our country. So it's an honor to be with you, and I hope to run into you in Traverse City someday. Sounds good. I'll look forward to it. We'll see you up north. Stay well. Take care. Take care. Stay healthy. All right. Thanks for following that. Uh, you know, really important that we be dialed in on, on these races, uh, you know, even the presidential race and certainly the, the Senate majority. This is happening one state at a time. Uh, it is super local. Tip O'Neill said all politics is local. I think all politics is is personal as well. Um, but uh, that's why, you know, if, if you care about where this country is headed, it's really important to, uh, you know, yes, uh, be involved in your backyard, but look beyond your, your neighborhood, too. And that's why I wanted to introduce you to Senator Peters, if you didn't know him uh, already. Um, so much in the news to, to think about right now. Uh, shocking revelations about the Trump campaign having a, a code called deterrence uh, for millions of black voters uh, in 2016. Uh, investigative reporting is revealing more of what a lot of us probably uh, already suspected, but uh, it's been documented in a new way. Uh, obviously, the revelations about the tax returns. Uh, to me, the, the really alarming thing, uh, not just how little the president paid in taxes. I mean, most of us paid more uh, than the president did, uh, in, uh, uh, even in the years when he was paying something. But just the fact that, that his uh, businesses have been losing so much money and the question marks over uh, who he owes hundreds of millions of dollars to, that's all the more reason we, we deserve a president who will actually be transparent and, and straight up with the American people, whether it's about his own finances or whether it's about something like the, the threat of, of a pandemic. Uh, you know, every day it feels like the stakes couldn't get higher and then we get a piece of information, a piece of news that lets us know, yes, they can. And so wherever you were uh, in 2016, wherever you were earlier this year in the primary, we've got to come together if you want to see this country get to a better place. And, and, and that, I see that happening. That's why I think we're going to win. Uh, so uh, thanks for taking a little bit of time to speak today. I'll see you uh, very soon, probably with another guest. I'm, I'm really enjoying these conversations. I hope you are too. Uh, when you see one coming up on Twitter or here on Instagram, definitely let us know. This is how we build the questions that, that I wound up asking uh, is the questions that are on your mind. So uh, uh, really excited to uh, carry on the conversation and excited to make sure we got some good news come November. Take care, everyone.